too much rickets about. Vitamin D, that's what they want. Milk, butter. Yes, I remember McGonagall in 1928. Most of the public health experts then were all for putting people into better houses. You remember? It was known as environmental control. Give the people good houses and the battle of community health is won. Well, we had a plan. To move half the people from a slum area to a new building estate. And McGonagall did quite a bit of the planning. The Mount Pleasant estate was one of the best in the country. Neat terraces of houses, each easier to keep clean, a bit of garden in front, and the streets given some character. The Ministry of Health authorized us to move onto this new estate half the population of our worst slums, what was called the unhealthy area. Now, as I said, McGonagall had quite a bit to do with this scheme. He agreed with the beneficial effects of good environment, but he wasn't content with the theory that good housing was the be-all and end-all of public health. You see, his was what I'd call a real scientific mind. Science couldn't put it in chains. So for five years, from the time the first residents moved to the Mount Pleasant estate, he and his staff took infinite pains to see whether the people who had moved from the slums did really improve in health on this model estate. He watched, and he compared the death rates in both areas yearly, compared the tendencies to certain diseases, like TB and rickets, in the slums and on Mount Pleasant. And he compared how long, on the average, people were living in the slums and on Mount Pleasant. And he asked the people personal questions about their incomes and how they spent them. It's the only way to get the causes behind statistics, not always a popular one. But it depends how it's done. And McGonagall and his staff got the facts. And mind you, this was years before opinion surveys and such like were a practice. And by 1931, McGonagall was beginning to tell his health committee the results. Gentlemen, there has been a reduction in the number of families wishing to become tenants of council houses. Now, this doesn't mean that the housing shortage has been entirely met that the people are satisfied with their present homes or that overcrowding has been eliminated. It means that fewer families now can afford to pay the rent of council houses. Families are moving to less commodious apartments in order to save a shilling or two a week which can be used for food. By 1932, he had completed a report for his town council based on four years of steady observation. In a special report on poverty, nutrition and the public health, recently submitted to the town council, I showed that there is more malnutrition on the Mount Pleasant model environmental estate than there is in our slums. This proves what I've been saying for years, that although slum conditions do adversely affect the health of the individuals, poverty is still the most potent cause of ill health. New housing must not take any of the money needed for food. Mr. Mayor, what does Dr. McGonagall suggest? that the corporation charge lower rents because I can tell him that's economically impossible. How long is it since you cried? Oh, I know there are financial problems. But it's no good any longer hiding behind details of the money system. No good patching up faults in bricks and mortar. The whole structure of living must be altered, is altering. We are passing to a new appreciation of the science of living. After that, he did a paper for the Royal Society of Medicine, and then the book. That bit in his speech about finance should not be tied up with food. What is it? Um, hiding behind the details of the money system and... Um... The whole structure of living must be altered. Yes, that's getting a shade more popular now, isn't it? You know, the United Nations Food Organization and... Um, what's his name? Uh, Sir John Boyd Orr. The empty slogans. A world safe for democracy, a land fit for heroes. These mean nothing. Plain people know what they want. They want security. And that doesn't mean doles, relief, or charity. The common man everywhere demands freedom from want. He demands it not only for himself, but for all men. There must be no more forgotten people. 
Yes, that's right. What else did McGonagall do? I mean, in his work as medical officer of health. Oh, just routine work. Like bringing down the infant mortality rate by 3%. That took seven years. We have six child welfare clinics in the borough today. To these, mothers bring their children from birth. McGonagall was very fond of children. I think that was partly because, as a doctor, he knew that the health of the community starts with the young, partly because he never had any children of his own. The card index is characteristic of the MOH's job. As more and more people use the clinics regularly, a record of the health history of each individual builds up so that the doctor can see the past of the patient sitting before him as well as the present. But although the facts on the cards were parts of the jigsaw of the whole district's health, in the consulting room, the people were individuals to McGonagall. And I think that's what made him great. The boys used to call him the cigarette card king. He always had some on him. Hmm, not a bad bunch of kids. I wonder if they've been immunized against diphtheria. Morning, Mr. McGreese. Feeling better? Aye, this weather will help. There's old Lampton. Reminds me he's a heart case. And he's leaving the corporation. I see he gets his medical for pension. Faces. It must be from the new garment factory. I wonder if there's anything injurious in the processes. I must ask Kipling to check on that. Really, that new cinema. Still, it's got the right ventilation. Suppose what it does to the aesthetic senses ain't my job. Or is it? Good morning, Mr. Lake. Yes, during his days of years, his years of days, the M.O.'s relationship with the fellow members of his community is a personal thing. But once a year, he has to prepare his annual report. And then, each individual becomes a figure on a chart. A statistic which increases or decreases the birth rate, the death rate, the amount of TB or cancer. Funny mind an M.O. must have. Yes, a concern for all the parts that make up the whole. Seeing the wood and the trees. Mr. Mayor and gentlemen, I have the honor to present my annual report. It is a pleasing duty to record that the infant mortality rate fell from 6% of live births last year to 5% this year. This was due to fewer cases of prematurity. Figures, figures. Take one, that child at 10 Lecton Street poor Mrs. Robson had. Didn't live. What do I mean by only 5% infants lost? Supposing that's 100. 100 women crying inside, in just our town. It will be seen from the chart on page 7 of my report that tuberculosis still takes a high place in the principal causes of death. I repeat my warnings that a higher nutritional standard for our people, combined with better environment, such as improved houses, are absolutely necessary if we are to fight successfully this... <laughs> I wonder the smoke abatement campaign. Hardly a factory manager in the borough now who isn't conscious of what they used to call a bit of soot. It all helps. The open air school, that's a good thing. The first of its kind in the country. Sliding glass petitions that make the classrooms completely open to the sun. Kids can come here without interrupting their school curriculum. Sickly children or those recovering from an illness. Or those the school doctors found to show a tendency to chest or other troubles. Under the public health 
Meat Regulations, 1924, 21,460 carcasses of meat were examined by our inspectors in our slaughterhouses during this year. The number condemned, big responsibility, that. Every carcass has to be examined. No diseased meat can get through the slaughterhouses if everyone's doing his job. I wonder if the inspectors turn vegetarian in later life. Housing. Action under statutory powers during the year. Gentlemen, the number of dwelling houses in respect of which formal notices had to be served by us to the owners, requesting repairs to be undertaken for the tenants was 29. Number 17 Lyle Street was a queer case. Sanitary Inspector Harrison was asked by the tenant to come and have a look at her room. She said she'd been asking the landlord to repair the leaking roof for the last 12 months, but nothing had been done. The leaking roof was the last touch to a house in an already bad state. Harrison said he'd take the matter up. Now, before we serve a statutory notice on landlords, there is an informal approach. So the inspector went to see the landlord. He found him living in a poor street himself. The man's sole income, apart from an old age pension, was the seven and six a week rent from the one house he owned. The repairs had been estimated to cost 30 pounds. He couldn't possibly afford it. Here was no case of profiteering, but it was a social problem. The old man couldn't really afford to own property and his tenant's health was suffering. Somehow, sometime, the borough must take over problems like that until enough new council houses are available. I have to report that during the year under review, 104 cases of scarlet fever were reported in the borough, which is 82 more than in the previous year. Although the actual number of cases has not been large, the severity... Good job I got that extra ward built on the fever hospital. Proper arrangements are important in a thickly populated borough like this. And there was an epidemic. Sister Hennessy did marvels. As medical superintendent of the isolation hospital too, I was kept pretty busy. I'm thankful we tracked down one source of the infection. Interesting example, that was, of how the community health services tie up. I was worrying about the number of scarlet fever cases that day when Kipling came in to report three new cases, all in the same outlying area, near High Farm, about five miles out of the town. Yes, the degree of concentration in that area justified a look round. I worked out the quickest way to get there and asked Kipling to get the veterinary surgeon to pick me up in his car. Handy to have the vet with you when you're visiting a farm. High Farm is one of our middle-sized farms run by a man named Henderson. Mixed farming he goes in for, and he's considered very efficient at it. I told him we were just doing a routine look around and asked casually if I might visit his milking sheds. Milk can be a strong medium of infection, widespread in its effects because it's distributed widely. The sheds were well kept, clean and complying with all the bylaws. And he had some good looking beasts. But I wasn't quite happy about one of the cows. I asked the vet to examine its udders. Yes, the cow had a slight mastitis. The infected place could provide a breeding ground for a scarlet fever germ, carried there by a human being. The farmer said no milk had been sold from the cow since the mastitis was noticed. But infection could have been spread through the milk before then. 
The vet took a sample of the milk for analysis. Who milks this cow, I asked the farmer. Why, George, he replied. He's in the yard. How's the throat, George? Any soreness lately? As a matter of fact, it has troubled me a bit. Not worth worrying a doctor about. I asked Henderson if we could use his kitchen. Hi, come right, he said. So in the home of the Hendersons, we started tracking down the germ carrier who'd been causing a lot of trouble in our district. To the Hendersons, it was as exciting as any detective novel. We settled George down and prepared to take a swab of his throat. The swab went away that night for a culture to be made. The report that came back confirmed that George was a carrier and we had isolated one source of an epidemic. I have pleasure in reporting a very successful year with the Cripples Guild, thanks to the work done by the special committee formed to look after crippled children in our boundaries. Fifteen pairs of special surgical boots were supplied, six pairs of crutches and five pieces of special equipment. A special party was held at the Norton Church Hall at Christmas for our hundred crippled children, and I have to report that... gentlemen, I would like to say this. We used to think that the millennium in public health would come about by perfect control of hygiene alone. The new world was in a test tube. But in recent years, the personal side of public health has come back to occupy the minds of the sanitarians. The health of a community is intimately bound up with both aspects, and public health work is passing through a phase of expansion. Upon the broad-mindedness and the vision of our local authorities depends the future health of our people. I have the honor to remain, etc., etc. I he remains all right. In the things he started, which have now been taken many steps further, and in the work of all the other medical officers of health in Britain. But most of all, McGonagall lives on in that spirit of free inquiry for the people's good, and in the high value which Britain sets on the welfare of the individual. 